Now that we have covered all the theory, let's go through an example and apply what we have learned. We will start from the very beginning. That's even before we have a hypothesis. So let's go. Deco is an online retailer that sells home decor items. They recently added lamps as a new category of products, which they were not selling before. In order to generate awareness and boost sales, they want to do a promotion through their app. Their notifications have good success in the past, and they are considering a $10 discount through in-app notification. But at the same time, they want to be judicious about any features or releases when it comes to their app because they know that the LTV of a customer who has installed their app is much higher. They want to be careful so as not to drive users to uninstall the app. Now, this is a very common scenario that you may encounter in your work. So let's go through uh, the entire process of hypothesis generation to uh, analysis of results that we get from A-B test. So the first question is, can they run an A-B test in this scenario? Yes, they can. In fact, given that they are worried about driving uninstalls and there is a cost involved, it makes sense for them to first do an A-B test to see what the expected conversion and uninstall rate will be instead of just going ahead with the change. Now, in this case, what is the hypothesis? We are not talking about the null hypothesis yet. What is the business hypothesis? We can use the hypothesis template that we learned in tutorial five for this. So here goes. Because we have seen good success through in-app notifications in the past, if we send an in-app notification with a promotional offer for lamps, then the percentage of users that purchase from the lamp category will increase. Let's say here the primary metric we are interested in is a transaction rate, that is percentage of users that will make a purchase. Secondary metric uh, is purchase value. And of course, we want to keep an eye on the uninstalled rate. So that is also something we will be tracking and monitoring. Now, let's assume that you have arranged the resources and the test is all slotted to be run. Let's think about the design of the test. Remember, we discussed in the very beginning of the course that there are two scenarios when we can use an A-B test. One is when we are testing just one element, or second, when we are testing different campaign designs or approaches. This example is a use case for the second scenario because we want to see if sending a notification increases conversion. So the design in this case is simply we have one group that receives the notification and another that does not. Before we start the experiment, the first thing we do is determine the sample size needed for the experiment to attain significance. Like we discussed in tutorial 13, if you are using an A-B testing tool or platform, this is something that can be calculated there. If not, you can also use R or Python to get it. So let's see how we can get sample size in R. I'm going to assume that you have a working knowledge of R. If you do not have any experience with R, but uh, you have some programming background, this should not be hard for you to follow. If you have zero programming background, then focus on the parts where I will explain the result and not so much on the code. Again, unless you are an engineer or a data scientist, working in A-B testing, you will not be required to really code this. So let's switch over to our R window now. There we have it. Just to orient you, uh, this is my editor in R where I will type the code. When I execute it in the R console here, I can see the lines that were executed and the result. Let me first remove all the um, existing um, elements here. Okay, great. 
that's better so this is the editor this is the console on the top right here is the environment uh, which is where any data set or any vector that i'm creating or any data set i'm importing will be stored and on the bottom right is where i can change the directory or i can view my graphs or list of packages help window is also here so we will primarily use this section to see the graphs that we will be creating so i'll, I'll primarily be on this this um, this part of the window so i have detailed the background i've listed the background hypothesis and the metrics that we are interested in and this piece here is what helps us calculate the sample size so let's go over it first we'll go through each of the lines uh, for the whole block and then we will run it all together we will use a package called power uh, it's pwr you can install it using the install.packages function uh, and then you can call it using library function we will specify the conversion of our control which in this case is uh, we know from prior data is 10.1 percent or 0 0.101 uplift here refers to the minimum detectable effect let's say we want at least 20 percent relative change that is if treatment outperforms control by 20 percent or more we want to be able to detect it Given these inputs, we will get the variant, which is nothing but one plus uplift into control. Then we will use es.h function to get the effect size. This is an input for the power.p.test function, which we will eventually use to get the sample size. So in order for us to get the effect size, we will run, run es.h and the inputs that that function takes is the conversion rate for the control and a variant. Once we have that, we will use that as an input along with a significance level and power uh, in this function to get the sample size. We have assumed a significance level of 5% and the power of 80%. After this, I'm running the ceiling function here to simply get the smallest integer greater than the result we got, just in case we got a non-integer value in uh, our calculation here. Okay. So let's run uh, this entire piece of code. You can see here, once I ran it, I got the lines that I ran and the result. Uh, and then these some of these values were created in the environment here. So this gives us the result, which is that we need a sample size of at least 1,896 per variation for a statistical significance of 95% and a power of 80%. Now let's say the experiment was done and you have received the file with the data collected from each variation of the landing page. So let's load the file here. So this is how I will be loading the file. The first thing we do before any analysis is to see what the file has. So we can do this using the str function. str function is short for structure and it basically gives info on the basic structure of the data set. So let's run this little piece of code. We can see here that the file has 100,000 observations and eight variables. The result also shows the list of variables, what type of variable it is, and the sample values that uh, the variable takes. So let's go through the variables quickly. We have user ID, which is nothing but the unique ID for each user. Allocation, it represents the whether the user was assigned to the treatment or the control variation. Active 6M represents whether the user was active on the app in the last six months. Days since represents the number of days since their last activity on the app. Then we have add to cart flag. This is an indicator for whether the user added an item from the lamp category to the cart during the test duration. One will mean that they added to cart and zero means they did not. Next, we have transaction flag. Here one means they made a purchase and zero means they did not. Purchase value has uh, the dollar value of the item from the lamp category that they've purchased. So if transaction flag is zero, then this should not have a dollar value. 
quick quality check we can do on the data. So if we uh, look at the data manually, we can see this. So I just opened the data set. And if we just scan through it, we can see that when, whenever transaction flag is zero, the purchase value is NA. Right? So, so that's just a quick manual kind of check. Uh, you can also quote this. It's pretty straightforward. I'm not going to go over uh, it here because I want to spend more time on the analysis here. But, you know, quality check for the data is a very important step that you should always spend a lot of time on as well. Now that we've seen what's in the data, let's do a quick summary. So to summarize, we have our treatment indicator, which is the allocation variable. Then we have some response variables, add to cart flat, transaction flat, purchase value that we expect to improve based on the change we are making through the test. We have some baseline variables. These are existing kind of features of the users or information about the user that we don't expect to change based on this. And then we have other variables such as uninstall flag, which we want to keep an eye on. Now that we know what the file has, let's get some quick stats on these variables using the summary function for numeric variables and the table function for categorical variables. I'm going to run this piece for the numeric variables. And we can see the results here. This basically uh, what it does is for each variable, it gives me the distribution in the form of, you know, min, max uh, and uh, the quartiles. We can see that 75% of users have been active on the app in the last six months. 25.63% of people added an item from the LAMP category to the cart. 14% have purchased from the LAMP category. There have been 4% uninstall rates while the test was running. Average purchase value is 305. I'm rounding off here. So you can see there are NAs here. That is because when there is no purchase, this field has is taking a null value. So that makes sense. And then we have days since. Looks like 50% of users have been active in the last four months. How did I conclude that? Well, I took the median value and I uh, divided it by 30 to get that. 